morning, church. Happy Easter. You know, I don't care what kind of uh, day you had yesterday or evening you had last night or, or overnight. I don't know how you slept, but the greatest news of the day today is that Jesus, still in the year 2020, is still alive. And we got so much to celebrate about today. We are so excited about what God is going to do today. I'm just going to be honest with you, this is still very strange. None of us are used to this yet, uh, with just myself and Kimberly and Wesley here uh, leading in the, in the, the service today. It, it's, still, it's still very strange, especially, especially, and I think this is true for everyone. In my 41 years, I don't think that I've ever not, on Easter Sunday, gathered together with church family to celebrate the risen King, even as a little kid. Uh, before we were regular churchgoers, before we were coming here to Harris when I was a kid, we would get up and we would go to church with my grandparents. And we would all be dressed all out, being dressed nice. And you'll notice today that I put on the full suit, even though it's just me and Kim and Wesley. There's something about Easter. Here's the other thing that I've noticed. I don't know how your quarantine time is going, how your isolation is going, but I've noticed that my isolation body is not so isolated in this suit. It's a, it's a, I'm a little plumper than I was before all this stuff hit, uh, so I'm going to have to work on that a little bit, but uh, hopefully you're not having too much of that same problem that I'm having today. But we're dressed up, we're here, we are excited, and I'm so glad. I'm looking online, and I'm seeing 34 different families that are watching with us, and I'm so glad that you've chosen to be here with us today. We are live. This is not pre-recorded. This is Sunday morning. Uh, you're watching this as this happens. It's 10.02 in the morning. And we decided today that we were going to go uh, live at 10 o'clock because we figured with Easter, probably some of you rebels are still going to meet together with some of your family and uh, just give you guys a little extra time that we have to, uh, to be able to do this. So we're going to just worship the Lord today and remember the theme today. Everything that we're doing today is to celebrate the King of Kings and the fact that he is still alive. The tomb is still empty. You are still saved and forgiven because of what he did. And we ought to celebrate. We ought to celebrate. You ought to be shouting your living room down, shouting down wherever it is that you're at watching this, because we serve an alive Savior. And that is so amazing today. So get ready to sing with us. Worship in your house. Amen. Comment there. Talk back and forth with one another as you see people, uh, as you see people talking and, and being online there and stuff. So just just communicate, and we're going to sing some songs and we're going to preach an Easter service, Easter message, and we're going to finish with a with a final song before we're done. But today is not about bunnies. It's not about candy. It's not about chocolate or eggs or food at all. Even surprisingly, today is about Jesus. We just want to focus on that. So let's just start with prayer this morning. If you would, where you're at, just bow your hands and we'll just go to the Lord in prayer together. Father God, we are thankful for what today represents in the life of a believer in Jesus, someone who is, is saved by the blood, saved by the work of the cross, saved by the empty tomb that represents a risen Savior, Father. We're so thankful for Jesus that you came, that you lived on this earth for us, that you took all sin became sin, Father, so that our sin could be dealt with. We thank you, Lord, that you showed and, 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 and illustrated and demonstrated to us that you loved us so much that when we were still unworthy of it, you came and died for us. We're thankful for the empty tomb that it represents the fact that you have power over death and the grave. We're so thankful today that wherever we're at as your church body, that we will be able to feel your presence, that we will be able to feel and know that we are in the presence of the most high living God. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we ask that you just sanction every aspect of this service and that everything that is said and done will be done to lift up the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that for all of those that are out there watching this today, or if they're watching it at a later time, Lord, I pray that you would just... Bless them. God, I pray you hear their prayers. Father, if they're lost and they don't know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that you just touch their heart, Lord. And Father, that they would give their life to you. 
Father, if there's anybody watching that's gone astray, Lord, they used to serve you. They used to be uh, regular in church. They used to really study the word. But, Father, time and things in life have gotten in between them and their relationship with you. And they've, they've, they've grown distant. Lord, I pray that you'd use the services they watch it today to draw them back closer to you. Lord God, we just seek to do only one thing and one thing alone today, and that's honor you. We love you. We pray for voices as we sing. We pray for uh, our playing abilities as we play. And Father, we just pray that all worship could be felt today from wherever we're at and that we would honor you with our praise. God, we thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. Say it where you're at in your house, church. Amen. Amen. Let's sing some songs together this morning. We're going to start with Victory in Jesus.
We thank you for your son. And we thank you for the cross. Jesus, your blood did run red so that we can be cleansed as white as snow. And we're so grateful every day, but especially today as we celebrate you, we worship you. Father, just be with each person where they're at, in their house, in their living room, wherever they're watching this. Just touch, bless, and fill their houses with your spirit. It's in your name we pray. stuff here and I believe that if we were all here together I think these altars would be filled because we would be just praising God in just a powerful way just the three of us here and we can feel the presence of God moving very very powerfully and, uh, and I pray that you can still feel that as well at your house where you're at right now that the power of God is not confined to a building it's not confined to a location the power of God resides within the people of God. The power of God is with us. When the Holy Spirit is with us, the power of God is with us. And I'm so thankful for that. I want to just take you to the cross this morning. And I want us to just examine a few things. And God, had, this has been on my heart this week to talk about. And, and I've been, been wondering, you know, with, with us not being able to be here on Easter Sunday at the church building here at the, at the location, I've been thinking, how is this Easter going to, going to be different than the rest of the Easter's, you know, that we've had? Uh, you know, most of the time, Easter's are about the same. I know that gradually traditions might change within family as certain family members um, grow older and pass on and kids move off and and get their own families, and, and it kind of changes the tradition of things. It kind of changes how Easter goes. And, uh, we've all agreed that this Easter is very weird, that we cannot come together, because Easter is a big deal for those who follow Jesus. Easter is it. I mean, Easter is the big one. And uh, we, we get dressed up. We dress our family up. You know, all the other 51 Sundays of the year, our kids come looking like they're homeless. But on Easter Sunday, they're dressed up. They've been showered. They've been bathed. They've been put in some brand new clothes that look real nice and Eastery. I remember when I was a kid, we always had those really pastel looking pink shirts and those clip on ties. And, and, and usually the shirts were short sleeved. And, and I remember, man, on Easter Sunday, you just got dressed up. You got dressed up. Um, but I'm sure some of you are really dressed up this morning in your PJs. And I bet they're nice PJs. I bet they're not pastel colored, but I don't really want to see them. Uh, but when we look at, and I've been asking myself and thinking about this this week, what makes this Easter different from the other Easter's? What is it that we need to really know about Easter? And I think that what God has been doing in the church and in his people, his believers over the last three or four weeks or however long that we've been having to do this, I think we've really been getting down to the basics of what we believe and why we believe. And uh, I think that what this, this whole thing has caused us to do is examine, are we really in this for the right thing? I mean, do we just come to church out of habit? Do we just come to church because mom did and dad did? And do we come to church because we were raised in church? And you know, just think about that. I, I think that this really has been an opportunity for us to understand more about our faith and more about the church, not the building, but the church and more about our own personal walk and relationship with Christ. And so when I was thinking about that with Easter, I was thinking, what is it really that we need to learn about Easter? If it's not about getting dressed up and coming to church, if it's not about Easter eggs, if it's not about bunny rabbits, if it's not even about the, the big dinner that you usually have with your family, then what is Easter about? And I began to read the scripture and some things really stood out to me. And what really stood out to me is that in scripture, while Jesus was dying on the cross, I believe that there were seven statements that he made that really clue us in as to what Jesus thought 
about Easter. He had some things to say that help us understand a little better what Easter is really all about. And what I want to do for a few minutes this morning, a little different than what I've done before in the past preaching, but I want to just take you through just very quickly these seven statements that Jesus made. Seven things that Jesus said that I believe as I was reading them this week and really studying on it last night. I really believe that this is what Jesus had to say about Easter. And he didn't say anything about meeting in a building. He didn't say anything about getting all dressed up. I think that Easter goes much more deep than that. It's deeper than that. It's, it's, it's much more spiritual than that. It's not about the things we can see. And so let me just share with you some of the things that Jesus had to say about Easter. And I'm going to look at the first point. It's found in Luke chapter 23, verse number 33. Hopefully you guys can see that okay and that it's not too too bright and, and you can follow along. But if you have a pen and some paper, if, if I'm going too fast, write these things down so that you can read them for yourself. Because I think it's important that we see what Jesus had to say concerning Easter. Um, but the very first thing that Jesus had to say concerning Easter is that Easter is about forgiveness. Easter is about forgiveness. Luke chapter 23, verse 33 and 34 uh, the scripture says this, when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. That's the two thieves, one thief on the right hand, one thief on the left side. Verse number 34, the very first thing that Jesus says from the cross as they have nailed him to the wood and they have suspended him up in the air on the cross between the heavens and the earth. Jesus says this, Father... Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiments and they cast lots. Now here's the amazing thing that really stands out to me about this, is that at this moment in time, as Jesus began his time on the cross, I mean, he's already been through some terrible beatings, he has been scourged, he has been mocked and ridiculed, his beard pulled from his face, the crown of thorns has been twisted tightly down onto his skull, and, and, and just his, his, his scalp has been shredded and torn, and his body is mangled and broken, and they punched him, and he's swollen and bruised, he's dehydrated, his body is in a state of shock, and the first thing that Jesus says while he's hanging there between two common criminals just suspended above the earth is he says, Father, forgive. I think what Jesus was saying right there with his very first statement from the cross was that Easter is about forgiveness. It's not about eggs and it's not about food. Easter is about forgiveness. The soldiers had abused and mutilated him. His friends had abandoned him. They cut and they run away. The crowd was surrounding him, shouting some mocking statements at him. They were really trying to make him feel terrible. They were speaking hatefulness and hatred to him as he hung there on the cross. And in the midst of all of that, Jesus was interceding to the Father on our behalf while they were killing him. They're in the middle of committing the very act of murder. And in that moment of time, as Jesus is being brutalized on the cross, he is interceding on your behalf. In other words, what he's doing is he was going to the Father so that you and I would not have to face the punishment for his death. I love that. He says, Father, forgive them. He's talking about all of those that are surrounding him. He's talking about the soldiers that nailed his hands and nailed his feet to the cross. He's talking about those who whipped his body so bad that he could not even be recognized as a man. They, he was talking about those who ripped the beard out of his face and those who twisted that crown of thorns down onto his head. He's talking to those who were standing out around him looking up at him and shaking their fist in defiance and shouting profanities at him. He's talking about the thieves that are hanging on both sides of him as he is, is, is hanging there dying. He says, Father, forgive. He's interceding on behalf of those who are killing him. But what's amazing to me that really spoke out 
is that He's not only interceding for them at that moment, and we've read this this way before, that yes, Jesus was saying, forgive these that are crucifying Me because they don't understand what they're doing. Or forgive these that are mocking Me because they don't understand what they're doing. But at the same time, that Jesus was interceding with the Father on their behalf. He was interceding with the Father on your behalf as well. You say, preacher, what are you talking about right there? I wasn't present 2,000 years ago. I didn't swing a hammer. I didn't twist the crown of thorns. I didn't pull a hair out of his face. I didn't shout anything mockingly or hatefully at Jesus as he was hanging there. You weren't there, but it was your sin that placed him there. It is your sin that he was dying for. It was your sin that caused him to have to endure the brutality of the cross. It is your sin and mine that caused him to have to go through what he went through. And because of that, he was not just interceding for the one that swung the hammer. He was not just interceding for the one that twisted the crown of thorns. But he was interceding for all humanity. He was interceding for you. He was interceding for me. He was going to the Father and saying, Father, don't hold this against them because they don't understand what they're doing. He was at that very moment seeking our forgiveness. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 1 and 2 says, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. World. And Paul was saying right there, he didn't just die for my sins. He didn't just die for the criminal sins that were hanging on both sides of him. He didn't just die for the sins of the one who was crucified or shouting that he should have been killed. But he died for the sins of all humanity. He died so that you and I, all of us, could be forgiven of the Father. But verse number two, it says right there, and he is the propitiation. That word propitiation is a tricky word because we don't really use that in the English language all that often. That's not something that we're real common or, or we're familiar with. But that word propitiation comes from the original Greek in the New Testament. The Greek word was halismos and halismos. And halismos literally translates to mean the appeasement or the payment thereof. See what Jesus was doing there on the cross was he was saying I am standing in as your payment. I am purchasing your forgiveness. Listen, as he is hanging there on the cross, as he is hanging there on the cross between two thieves and surrounded by people that hate him, his creation that hated him, his creation that was created in his own image, he was filled with grace and mercy and he was filled with compassion for those who sent him to that cross. We're not always so grace-filled, are we? When we've been wronged, when we're hurting, when we're having to be carrying our own cross for one reason or another in this life, we seek out vengeance and justice against those who have hurt us and the systems that have wronged us. But yet Jesus was filled with grace for us in that He was not deserving of the cross that He received, but He was willing to take it on so that you and I could be forgiven. He was purchasing our freedom. He was paying for our sin there and what he did on the cross there purchased our forgiveness and basically what Jesus was saying with his very first statement from the cross was Easter is about forgiveness and it makes me wonder who is it that we need to forgive in our life the people that have done us wrong the people that have hurt us the people that we don't like the systems that we feel like we've been betrayed by in this world are there people that we have withheld forgiveness from? Who should we be granting grace for in our life? Matthew 6, 14 and 15, Jesus said, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. That's scary. Jesus is hanging from the cross and he says, All right, Easter is about forgiveness. 
You have been forgiven by what Jesus did on the cross. Who should you also be forgiving? The second statement that we find is found in Luke chapter 23, verse 39 through 43. Luke 23, 39 through 43. Easter, Jesus says, is about the promise of heaven. I love that. It's about the promise of heaven. As he hangs there between two common criminals, it says this, and one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Look at what Jesus said, this statement from the cross. Jesus said unto him in verse 43 of Luke 23. Verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. You know what's really amazing about this is that Jesus was basically saying, I'm doing this so that you can have an eternity in paradise. I'm doing this so that you can have an eternity in heaven. You see, what really stands out to me about what Jesus says right there is that Jesus here, the perfect being, the creator of the universe, had no sin or flaw or guile within him, is hanging there dying the death of a common criminal. On one side, he's got a common criminal, a thief on the other side hangs another common criminal, a thief. And as they're, they're hanging there together, the one thief is really in his death. He's dying a defiant death. He's dying a criminal's death. With his last breath, he is spouting out hatred and guile and bitterness. And he's riding against, railing against Jesus there. He's really saying some terrible things to Jesus who's on the side of him. And he says, if you really are who you say that you are, why don't you save yourself from that cross you're hanging on and then save us as well? Thief on the other side, common criminal, says, if you knew who he was talking to, you you would talk that way. Don't you know who God is? And then he looks at Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. What's really amazing about that is when that thief looked at Jesus and said, Lord, could you remember me when you enter into that kingdom that you're going to? Jesus had all kinds of responses that he could have made. If that had been me hanging on the cross, I would have looked at him and I would have said probably sarcastically, Oh yeah, pal, that's the first thing on my mind right now is taking care of you. I'm going through excruciating pain. I'm dealing with a lot of hurt right here. But you want me to remember you? I'm here because of you. I'm hanging here because of your misdeeds, your sin, your faults, your failure. But oh yeah, I'm going to remember you when I get into heaven. Jesus could have said, I'm a little busy here. I got some things going on. Do you think I feel like doing anything good for you right now? But Jesus didn't respond in that way. And the reason why is because above all things, Jesus knew that that's the very reason he was hanging on the cross. Jesus knew that the very reason that he came from heaven to earth and went to the cross, the very reason that he was hanging there was to seek and to save that which was lost according to what he said in Luke 19 and 10. He came for the very reason of remembering us when he entered into his kingdom. Whenever we cry out to Jesus, whenever we have been saved by what he has done for us on the cross and resurrected from the grave, he remembers us in his kingdom and we are promised a place in heaven. Salvation produces eternal life with Jesus, with the Father in heaven eternally. I love that. I love that. He offers grace and remembrance. Notice one thing that Jesus didn't say. Jesus didn't look at him and say, all right, pal, I will, but first I need you to get yourself off that cross. And I need you to go shower and I need you to go say some prayers and I need you to go give this to the this person and that to that person. Jesus didn't place any requirements there for this man's salvation. You say, what do you mean, preacher? 
So many times we think that there's a lot of things we got to do in order to be saved by Jesus, but this man is the great representation of the first person, the first Christian, the first saved individual that we see that has been saved by what Jesus is doing on the cross because he does two things. While one thief, one common criminal is denying Jesus and who he is, this other thief, this other common criminal does two things. He expresses remorse for the sin in his life and then he expresses his belief in who Jesus is. If we would repent of our sin and if we would believe with our hearts and confess with our mouth who Jesus is, that's all it takes to be saved. We don't have to pay a certain amount of money to a certain kind of church. We don't have to dress a certain way. We don't have to clean ourselves up at all. All we got to do is repent of our sin like He did and believe upon Jesus like He did. And the same promise, the same grace, the same thing that was offered to that feat is going to be offered to you as well. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Romans 10 and 9 is where we get if, that if thou shalt confess with my mouth, the, thy mouth with the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We must decide which criminal we are. Are you the criminal that will deny who Jesus is and spend an eternity in hell? Or are you the criminal that will show remorse for your sin and accept who Jesus is and believe upon him? Easter is about the promise of heaven because of what Jesus did. I got to move on here real quick. Number three is found in John chapter 19, verse 26 and 27. This one is really neat to me. He says this in John 19, 26 and 27. It says, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, talking about John, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. You see, the third thing that Jesus says there to me says that Easter is about God providing. Easter is about God providing. Here's the amazing thing. God always provides for the needs of his people. Always. Every need that you have, God has taken care of. Every need that you will ever have in your life, God has already provided for. Please don't think that if you've got a need right now, that God doesn't know about it. Please don't think that if you have a need right now in your life, that God doesn't care or that God's not going to do anything about it. God has promised in His Word that He will supply all our needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Listen, that is an eternal stockpile of riches in glory. That is a stockpile stockpile of help that will never run out. That is a stockpile of help in heaven for God's people that is never going to go away. That is showing us that all of your needs, all of my needs, God has already taken care of in Christ Jesus. Now, I know that you're probably sitting back thinking some of you, but I need this right now, and I've got this need right now, and I need this right now. Listen, we've got to understand the difference between what we want and what we need. And a lot of times the things we think we need are simply because we've dug ourselves holes that we can't seem to get ourselves out of. Mm. What we need is the things that God has already provided for us. God is willing and able and desires to take care of His people. All the way back from the beginning of time at creation, when humanity fell, God was already providing for their needs. The scripture says that they tried to cover themselves with leaves, but God killed some animals Himself. The first death was God killing an animal so that He could take the skins and cover Cover the nakedness of humanity. God provided the need. When you look at what God did with Abraham and Isaac, as God sent Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac on Mount Moriah, they climbed to the mountaintop without a sacrifice. And Isaac said, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide. What they didn't know was at the very time they're walking up one side of the hill, God was walking around up the other side of the hill. God is always taking care of our needs, no matter what. But also, Scripture says that from the foundations of the world, God had a plan 
in place for salvation. God supplies every need of his people. And you say, Pastor, what does that have to do with what Jesus said to Mary, his mama, and John? As Jesus hung there on the cross, he loved his mama so much. And according to Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish culture and tradition and custom, it was the responsibility of the firstborn son to take care of the family when the father was gone. Obviously, Joseph had already passed away. He's not in the story of Jesus' adult life and ministry. So the responsibility of taking care of Mary was on Jesus' shoulder. And Jesus loved his mama so much that as he hung there on the cross, he said something that should resonate with all of us. He said, Mama, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. You know what Jesus was saying right there? He cared so much about his mom that he wanted to make sure that she would be taken care of and provided for after he was gone. He was looking out for his mama. I want you to understand, I never noticed that the scripture said this, but the scripture said that from that moment forward, John took care of Mary as though he, she was his own mama. It says that she lived in his house from that moment forward. That's spectacular to me. That's amazing to me to see that Jesus, even in the midst of pain and death, was caring enough to make sure that people were provided for. You see, I think Easter is a reminder that God provides. Moving along, number four. Easter is about hope. In John chapter 19, verse 28, it says this. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were new, were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. I thirst. See, Jesus was experiencing extreme thirst at that moment in time because there's no telling how long it had been since he had been given a drink of water and anything, any food, and the evening before, before he was arrested, before they were in the garden at the, at the last supper was the last time he had been able to get a drink of water. And as he was hanging on the cross, not only was he thirsty from being a, a long time since he'd had a drink, but he's endured great pain and trauma and shock to his body and system. And as he's hanging there, struggling to breathe, he's, he's experiencing extreme thirst. And he says, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Now, on the surface, what is happening here is Jesus is causing a fulfillment of prophecy, a prophecy of the Messiah that was given in Psalm 69, verse 21, when it said, They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Because when Jesus said, I thirst, one of the soldiers got a sponge out on a spear and dipped it into some vinegar and hefted it up there for him to be able to take a drink of that vinegar. And in doing so, fulfilling the prophecy of who the Messiah was back in Psalm 69 and 21. But what really is amazing to me about this is I looked up what that, that word thirst was in the Greek language. The word thirst in Greek is the word dipsio. And dipsio literally translates to mean this, to suffer thirst, or figuratively, those who are said to thirst, who painfully feel their want of, and eagerly long for, those things by which the soul is refreshed, supported, and strengthened. In other words, what Jesus was doing was Jesus was saying, I am thirsty to fulfill the scripture of the prophecy of the Old Testament that he was the Messiah. But also what he was doing was he was representing in the lost soul uh, this desire for that they don't know why to feel that longing that they have. Listen, I've shared this with you before, church, that every human being is born with a need of Jesus. They're born with a soul that desires something that only God can fulfill in their life. And we try and seek that quench of thirst in our soul through things of this world, through drugs, through alcohol, through through fame and money, through sexual pleasures, through all kinds of things on this earth. And still yet our souls thirst. 
believe that's why in John chapter 4, verse number 7 through 15, we read that refreshing in our soul comes only from Jesus. John 4 and 7 says, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were going away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knew the gift of God and who it was that saith unto thee, Give Give to me a drink. Thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep from whence thou hast asked thou that living water. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and the children, and his cattle? Listen to what Jesus says in John 4 and 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall first again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to drink. Listen, Easter is about hope in Jesus that quenches the thirst of our soul because of what he did on the cross. Because there is an to tomb today because he is still alive today as much as he ever was in the histories of humanity. You've got to understand that he is the hope for our strength, the hope for our refreshment, the hope for our encouragement. Jesus is our hope. I love that. Number five, we see that in Matthew 27, 46, it says, in about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When you read that verse and understand what's taking place there on the cross, you understand that Jesus is telling us right there that Easter is about the death of sin. Easter is about the death of sin. See, Jesus was expressing these feelings of abandonment right here as He hung suspended between, uh, between heaven and earth. And all the sin of humanity, past, present, and future, was present there on that cross where Jesus was. And in that moment, the Scripture says that the Father God turned away from Jesus. Now listen, there's a reason why the Father God turned away from Jesus. He turned away because where sin is, God cannot be. The holiness and the righteousness of God will not permit the existence of sin in His presence. And as He looked at that cross, God saw all sin of all mankind and all times hanging on the cross. And here's the thing that I've said before that God has really shown me. I've said this before. All the sin of all humanity was placed on the shoulders of Jesus. The scripture doesn't say that. The scripture doesn't say that all sin of all humanity was placed on the shoulders of Jesus. You know what the Bible says about this moment in time? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse number 21. It says, He hath made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God. We sing it in the song, Jesus Messiah. And we will sing that here before we close out this morning. But in that song it says, He became sin who knew no sin. That we might become His righteousness. Do you understand? That verse in that song comes from 2 Corinthians 5.21 that says, For He hath made Him to be sin for us. Listen, all the sin of all humanity was not placed on the shoulders of Jesus, but Jesus became all sin of all humanity for all time so that when He died, sin died as well. You've got to understand what that means. All sin of all humanity of all time died on the cross. When Jesus resurrected three days later from the tomb, 
sin did not, it, it did not leave the tomb with him. Sin died on the cross, and sin stayed dead till this very day. We ought to be running around circles in our living room this morning. We ought to be shouting hallelujah, even if it's just you and your kitty cat in the room listening to me this morning. We ought to be excited to know that the sin in our life that Jesus died to forgive us for died on the cross with him. We don't have to pick it up and carry those sins around with us anymore. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to let the guilt of our past haunt us for the rest of our life. We don't have to worry about if I'm worthy enough or good enough or if I deserve it or if I've earned it. You haven't earned it. You haven't been good enough. You're not worthy enough. But sin is dead because Jesus became sin and it died on the cross. Man, Easter is about knowing that sin has died. And something that is dead no longer has power in our life. Stop saying that sin is in control because sin is dead. Stop digging up that old zombie and died on the cross. Number six is found in Luke 23, 46. Luke 23, 46 says when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit, commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. As death was fast approaching, we see that Jesus was committed to completing the work of Jesus, the work of God, the work of the cross, the work of salvation. And that means to me that Jesus was telling us that Easter is about commitment. Easter is about being committed. It's about our commitment to God. And he showed us that it was about commitment by being committed all the way to the point of death and beyond. And in his final words, he was saying, Lord, in basic English, this is what Jesus said from the cross. Lord God, Father, here I am and I'm committing my spirit into your hands. He was committed into the, all the way to the end. You gotta understand that he was committing to serving the Father even if it meant death. Easter is about commitment. Easter should serve as a reminder to the child of God that we should be committed to our service to Jesus, our Savior. We should be committed in our service to the Father God. We should be committed in our service to the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit on this earth today. We should be committed to serving Him faithfully and sometimes even sacrificially the same way that Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 19 says, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. Being committed to Him means trusting that we are safe in the Father's hands. And can I tell you that Scripture just shouts to us today in the midst of all that we're seeing and dealing with and going through right now. We can see that we have to be willing to commit Commit ourselves no matter the circumstances because our commitment works as faith showing the Father that we trust Him through this. Into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. That should be the prayer of every child of God every Easter and every other day as well. Father, no matter what the day holds, I commit myself into your hands. Luke 10 and 27 says, and he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus said those are the two greatest commandments in all of the scriptures. And the first one is be fully, totally committed and sold out to Jesus. Easter is about commitment. Are you committed to the Father? Are you committed in your service to Jesus? Just because we can't come to church doesn't mean that we can't still serve. Lastly, the final statement of Jesus on the cross, found in John 19 and 30, says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. You see, when I read that statement of Jesus, it tells me that Jesus was telling us that Easter 
is about complete salvation. We are saved because of what Jesus went through on the cross. We are saved because Jesus was re resurrected three days later. We are saved because Jesus said, it is finished. With his final dying breath, his last words as he hung there on the cross, at the end of that six-hour period, he says, it is finished. What he was saying was all that needed to be done has been done. He was still with his final breath focusing on the mission of salvation. And I love the fact that I think I've read this on Facebook this week with all the different Easter posts and things that have been put up on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I've read somebody said, Jesus said, it is finished. He didn't say that he was finished. I love that. It is finished. What is the it that Jesus was talking about. The it that Jesus was talking about was the plan of salvation. All the work that needed to be done to purchase my forgiveness and yours. All the work that needed to be done. The plan that had been laid out by Father God from the very foundation of creation had now been fully completed. And from that moment on, you and I have been living in the age of salvation. The work of salvation has been finished since Jesus said the final words on the cross. It is finished. And it's complete. Jesus didn't say, I've done most of the work, the rest is up to you. Jesus didn't say, I've done all of this, now you've got to do this and this and this, and together the work of salvation will be completed. There are churches out there that say, well, yes, we must believe what Jesus did, but then we also must go through our 12-week class, and you must be baptized to be saved, and you must be a member of such and such style of church to be saved, and you've got to give a certain amount of tithe and money to this church or that organization to be saved, or you've got to believe exactly like, like what everybody else believes. In order, no, Jesus didn't say any of that. Everything that needed to be done for us to be saved, Jesus did it on the cross. Anything we try to add to after that is making a mockery of the work that Jesus did on the cross. We do not require anything other than to believe upon the Lord and call upon His name, and we will be saved because He said it is finished. He didn't say He was finished because three days later He can walk out of that tomb like he bought the place. He come walking out of there with the keys of all those things because he was the one who was in authority and in charge. He was not finished. He's still at work in my life and yours today. But huh, the work of salvation was complete. It was finished. You see, there's no more work that's needed to be done for you to be saved. You don't got to clean yourself up. You don't got to change your lifestyle. You don't got to look a certain way, speak a certain way, or attend a certain church, although I do recommend Harris Baptist Church, the best church on the face of the planet. <laughs> All he said was that we need to believe upon him. And he's done the work. He's done all the work. Another thing that hit me is he didn't say that he, he did most of the work. He also didn't say that he did it to save most of the people. There are some folks that, that say that God only plans to save a certain amount of people and God only plans to help a certain amount of people. But I, I just don't believe that because what Jesus did finished the work completely. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 and 14 tells us that. Colossians 2 13 and 14 says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. It was nailed to the cross. It's done. It's finished. It's complete. There's nothing more required. So we got to stop worrying about it. We, we got to stop carrying around whether or not are we saved or are we not. Am I doing enough to keep saved or am I not? Listen, if you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ with your heart, if you have repented of your sins and if you have called out his name to save you, then you are saved. You don't have to say a prayer at a church altar. That's fine if you do, but it's not required. You don't have to repeat the words of somebody else. You don't even have to have your eyes closed and your head bowed and your knees touching the ground to be saved by Jesus. 
The thief on the cross had his hands wide open and he was hung suspended between heaven and earth and he had his eyes open looking at Jesus with desire for salvation and he was saved. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus was telling us with his final words, Easter today is about complete salvation. If you're not saved, all the work that needed to be done for you to be saved has been done. All that's required of you is call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Those of you who are saved, it's because you expressed remorse and repentance for your sins. It's because you expressed faith and belief in who Jesus was. And it's because of the work that he did on the cross. And all he did was all that needed to be done. I love that we can get a complete picture of Easter based on what we see Jesus saying from the cross. We see what it says. We see that Easter is about forgiveness. Easter is about the promise of heaven. Easter is about God providing. Easter is about hope. Easter is about the death of sin. Easter is about commitment. And Easter is complete Salvation. All of these things together, Jesus was painting a picture verbally of what Easter looks like in the life of a follower of Christ. This morning, if you don't know Jesus is your Savior and you're watching this, I pray that you feel God talking to you and that you feel like God died for you, Jesus died for you. Just call upon the name of Jesus. If you've got questions about that, you can message me here. You can, you can send me a message. I'd love to visit with you about it. But if you have been saved, and we've forgotten what Easter is all about, let's remember that Jesus told us what Easter is about. And let's hold on to that, the fact that we are completely and totally saved. Let's have a word of prayer, and after I pray, we're going to sing one more song together. Father God, Lord, we thank you. We praise your name. And God, we just ask that right now that you would help us to see what Easter is all about. God, help us to get a vision and an understanding of Easter. But God, in doing so, as we see Easter more clearly, help us, Lord, to see you more clearly and understand who you are and what you did for us. We thank you that you were committed. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for salvation that is complete and final. Lord, as we sing one more song of praise, I pray that you let us all, all of us who are listening, feel your presence where we're at as we celebrate that you have risen. In Jesus' name, amen.
that you were blessed this morning by our Easter service. <clears throat> Boy, I have preached myself out of a voice, and I think Kim's about to shout amen on that. But uh, it's been a great service this morning. And I know that whether we are all scattered or we are here together, man, it, God is still the same God on the same throne, and Jesus is still alive, and the, the, the stone is still rolled away, and the tomb is still empty because Jesus is alive. And we celebrate that today at Easter. Church, I love you. I don't really miss you. I miss every one of you. And I pray that, that you're going through this time of isolation and, and, and unknown circumstances. I pray that you're going through it okay. And I pray that you have all that you need. I tell you, I know with my life, I've been, been with the little ones, taking care of them. And, and I feel like I've been busier since all this went down than I was beforehand. But I tell you what, God is still good. And I just pray that you're still blessed. I love every one of you. I miss every one of you. Uh, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and download our Easter service here in a little bit. And I'm going to put it on YouTube. I'm going to get a channel going for the church because I know that a lot of folks do not have you know, Facebook. And so they'll be able to go back to it on YouTube, on the church's YouTube channel, and find it there. So be looking for that, and I'll put a link. Uh, on Facebook for you to be able to share it. Maybe you can let others know who don't have Facebook. Um, so anyways, I love you, church family. I pray that you have a happy Easter. And whether you're with your family or not, I pray that you just have a great, wonderful, blessed day. Remember, God loves you. I love you. And so love each other. And we're just going to see God do great things through this. And on the other side of this, whew, Watch out, church. It's going to be great. We love you. God bless you. Bye-bye.